Margaret. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. I hope you can hear me okay. It's not a very big room, so I don't want to shout at you. Um, <clears throat> as Margaret said, my name is Christine Wormuth. I'm the Deputy Undersecretary for Strategy, Plans, and Forces at the Department of Defense. And I wanted to take the opportunity this afternoon to talk to you all a little bit about the highlights of our QDR 2014. Uh, this is a strategic document that, as you all probably know, the Department of Defense puts out every four years. Uh, it's an opportunity for the Secretary to articulate his vision for the Department of Defense for the next 10 to 20 years and to talk about how that vision will inform our efforts in the Department to plan and program for our future U.S. military. Um, this is very much before I sort of go into the substance of the document. I do want to underscore that this is a department-wide effort. We undertake this process with the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the Joint Staff, the services, the combatant commanders around the world. So it's very much a, a comprehensive effort. We also work closely with our partners in the interagency and the rest of the U.S. government and at the National Security Council. So it's very much a, a holistic approach to looking at our defense strategy. This year's QDR report has three primary themes. Uh, the first is to offer an updated defense strategy that builds on the defense strategic guidance that the administration put out in 2012. The second major theme in the document is to talk about how we are responsibly and realistically rebalancing the military going forward in the next 10 years, particularly given changes in the security environment, but also changes in our fiscal environment, which I'm sure all of you have been monitoring closely. And the third major theme is talking about how the department intends to rebalance itself internally uh, to try and make itself more efficient to get more buying power for our defense dollars. And a particularly important piece of that is our effort to try to control internal cost growth, particularly in our compensation programs, which make up a very substantial part of our overall defense budget. I would say that the QDR um, defense strategy, which is also called our national defense strategy, is an updated defense strategy, again, that builds on the priorities that were articulated in the 2012 defense strategic guidance. The first part of our QDR really looks at the security environment, and this is where we look out, we try to look out 20 years in the future to think about what are the challenges we think we may face, what kinds of threats are on the horizon, but also what kind of opportunities we see for the United States and our allies and partners to work together on common security challenges. I would just highlight a couple of pieces in terms of the security environment. We continue to pay close attention to events in the Asia Pacific region. That's obviously a very dynamic region where we see a lot of opportunity. We are, of course, concerned, however, about um, the activities in particular of North Korea in the Asia Pacific. We also see a lot of um, continued instability in the Middle East. Particularly, um, we're concerned about Sunni Shia tensions and also the ongoing political transitions that are coming out of the Arab Spring in the last couple of years. Those transitions we expect to continue to take some time to resolve themselves. We're also focused on the terrorist threat. Um, I think it's fair to say while we see that uh, we have significantly degraded core al-Qaeda in the Fatah regions um, and the, the threat to the, the direct threat to the United States may be reduced compared to what it was immediately after um, the 9-11 attacks, al-Qaeda and its affiliates have definitely spread and sort of franchised in various places around the world. We pay close attention to that and are very serious about making sure we have investments to deal with our counterterrorism capabilities, for example. And finally, I think I would flag, you know, the general influence of um, technology and the, the um, sort of empowerment and enabling of information technology that we see. We're also very focused on the technological side at um, developments in the cyber and space domains. Uh, this is cyber and space capabilities are obviously very important enablers for all of our operations um, across all of the parts of our strategy. We are also monitoring very closely the investments of other countries in the areas of space and cyber. We want to make sure that we have a good understanding and a good plan to protect against our vulnerabilities in those areas and also to make sure that we have appropriate capabilities in those areas going forward. In terms of the actual defense strategy that we articulate in the report, it really has three pillars. These pillars are, I would say, interrelated and interdependent. They're not mutually exclusive. 
Um, and again, they sort of incorporate important pieces of the, of the defense strategic guidance, like the rebalance to Asia Pacific, like our continued focus on the Middle East and working with allies and partners in the United States. But we've, we've tried to put that in a broader framework that highlights three big muscle movements. The first is an emphasis on protecting the homeland. And it's in this part of our strategy where we think about um, the importance of our nuclear triad, for example, as a deterrent. This is where we are making investments in terms of our national missile defense system, again, to protect against missile threats from countries like North Korea, but also the growing capabilities that Iran has. Um, <clears throat> and this is also where we pay attention to capabilities we need to provide support to our own civil authorities here at home to protect against natural disasters or man-made events. That's obviously a very important part of what we do in the department. And ever since 2005 with Hurricane Katrina, we have been growing and developing and refining our capabilities in that area. The second big pillar of our strategy is building security globally. This is a very important part of our strategy. It's a major um, piece of our strategy where we work very closely with allies and partners. Here we are really talking about our forward presence, which is important in terms of deterring conflict, deterring coercive behavior in regions around the world. This is where we would think about building partnership capacity, which is a very important part of our strategy. That's a theme that's, that's been in our previous QDR 2010 and our defense strategic guidance, but it's a very important part of our strategy. This is also, I think, where you would see, again, our focus on continuing to implement the rebalance to Asia Pacific through things like transitioning 60 percent of our naval fleet to the Asia Pacific region by 2020, for example. Things like deploying the LCS to Singapore, the joint high-speed vessel, for example, those type of um, commitments, but also just a real emphasis on growing our alliances and partnerships in that region in conducting more exercises of greater depth um, and, and having a lot of senior leader engagements, which we've certainly been doing in the last year or two and continue, plan to continue doing that. The third pillar in our strategy is sort of the more kinetic part of our strategy, which is projecting power and maintaining the ability to win decisively. And I think it's fair to say that, that the ability of the U.S. military to go anywhere in the world quickly is sort of a signature of our military and one of our core competencies, if you will. We, we intend to sustain that. And um, under this pillar, in addition to being able to project power for things like helping allies and partners respond to natural disasters, for example, like the, the recent typhoon in the Philippines or the tsunami and earthquake in Japan a couple of years ago, this is also where we would, where we would think about um, the capabilities we need to respond to crises, potentially unforeseen crises. This is obviously where we would have um, our capabilities to be able to respond to a provocation, for example, on the Korean Peninsula. This is also where we would think about um, a lot of our counterterrorism capabilities. And, and in the area of counterterrorism, the department plans to continue to keep all of our capabilities to conduct direct action against terrorist groups where appropriate, where we see a direct and imminent threat. But we also are going to sort of rebalance our focus in this area to, to really emphasize building partnership capacity with countries around the world to help them strengthen their own um, internal capacity to deal with terrorist threats. So again, I think part of what we want to do here is use our special operations forces as well as our general purpose forces to be able to help allies and partners build that capacity. Those are really the sort of the three pillars, uh, and I would say underpinning all three of those pillars is a real emphasis on innovation and adaptability. So we're trying to not just as a department think about things like better business practices, we're also trying to be more innovative in terms of how we deploy our forces around the world. So for example, we may deploy our carrier strike groups in new ways. We may break them up into smaller pieces so that they can do more in terms of exercises and port visits. We're also looking at how we can deepen our strategic planning with close allies like the UK, for example. And we are exploring things like joint training ranges with countries around the world. That kind of innovation we think is very important to pursue. Um, at the President's budget level, which is about $115 billion above 
the Budget Control Act level caps. I'm sure you've all heard a lot about sequester here in the United States and a lot of debate about that. The President yesterday put forward a budget that actually asks for more resources than we would get if sequestration were to continue. And he did that because he feels like we need those resources to be able to execute the updated strategy that I just sort of highlighted for you all. Um, we can execute the strategy at that level of resources with some increased risk in a couple of mission areas. I think that, that brings me to sort of the closing part of the QDR. And I'm sure you all know that the full report's available if you're interested on the department's website. But the last part of the report talks in some detail about what we think we would face if we return to sequester level cuts, <clears throat> excuse me, in FY16 and beyond. And I think it's fair to say that Secretary Hagel and Chairman Dempsey are quite concerned about what it would mean for our defense strategy if we are unable to find a solution to sequestration. Because in addition to the kinds of reductions in the size of the Army and the Marine Corps, for example, that Secretary Hagel rolled out last week, if we don't fix sequestration, we would have to make further cuts to the size of our military, but also make cuts into modernization, which we think would have negative impacts for our ability to counter anti-access and area denial threats that we see in a few different regions. We also worry that at sequester level cuts, we would have insufficient resources to ensure the kind of readiness levels that we need across the force, which is important on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of our ability to deploy forces around the world for the kinds of um, forward presence and partnership activities that I talked about, but also could have a real negative impact in terms of our ability to actually respond uh, decisively in a major combat operation. So we would worry about things like conflicts taking longer and having higher casualties for the United States and for allies and partners that might be involved in those campaigns with us. So those are some of the very significant risks I think that we're concerned about and that we have been highlighting particularly to Congress. The Secretary and the Chairman were up earlier in front of Congress today testifying about these issues and I think we feel very strongly that we very much need Congress to approve the President's budget level that was put forward so that we can execute this strategy, which we think is the right one for the United States. So with that, why don't I close um, my formal remarks and I'd be happy to take questions on the QDR report. Okay, if you could wait for a microphone, please identify yourself and your outlet. Thank you very much for doing this. My name is Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. Uh, I have two questions, actually. Uh, the first one, uh, the balance to Asia-Pacific is listed as the number one priority in the QDR. How important is the China factor to be considered when you prepare the QDR? Uh, is China considered as a major challenge for the United States strategically? And my second question is today China announced its defense budget uh, for this year, which is increasing by 12.2%. And the spokesperson of Chinese foreign ministry said the foreign countries should not expect that China is a boy scout that will not grow up forever. Do you have any comments on that? Thank you. Thank you for your great question. Um, I think, you know, we see, you're correct, the um, rebalance to Asia Pacific is a very important part of our strategy. I don't think I would go so far as to say it's the number one priority. We, as a, as a global leader, have a number of responsibilities and a number of priority areas, but it's certainly one of the very important elements of our strategy. You know, I think it's important to note that um, some have wanted to interpret the rebalance to Asia Pacific as an effort to contain China. It is not an effort to contain China. We see ourselves as a Pacific power, the United States, and we see a variety of opportunities in the region. It's, an, it's a very dynamic area. Our trade relationships are growing there with a number of countries. Certainly we have a, an, a very deep trade relationship with China. So I think it's important to be clear that the rebalance is not aimed at a particular country. That said, we certainly um, pay close attention to China's military modernization and um, the, the general trends and directions in China's military development. 
I think it's our view that um, we would like to see more transparency in terms of Chinese intentions behind the various elements of its modernization, and, and certainly in our bilateral discussions with China have emphasized that we'd like to see more transparency. Um, and so, of course, you know, we, we, we noted the reports of uh, the investments that China will be making in its defense budget and pay close attention to that. And I think, again, would continue to call for greater transparency about its programs. Uh, I think an important part of gaining that transparency is having a truly sustained and robust military to military dialogue with China, with the PLA, with the PLAN and having a good set of senior leader exchanges. And we've put a lot of emphasis on those. Secretary Hagel has been to the region um, a number of times. And I think, you know, we are, we are trying to grow the depth and maturity of that relationship. Okay, we'll go to the last one. Lee from KBS. Uh, what do you think is the most important change uh, this year's uh, QDR uh, compared to the last one. I saw some the increase of the uh, foot soldiers, possibility of increase in foot soldiers uh, to the Korean Peninsula. Is it right? And then uh, also your paper the, uh, the put uh, some stress on the uh, military defense. So uh, what do you think what do you think of the uh, relation between the uh, uh, KA, KMD, Korean version of uh, military defense, and then and your the military defense? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. I, I would say um, the sort of, if I were to pick two things about the updated defense strategy that I think are um, significantly different from the defense strategic guidance, I would highlight um, again sort of a renewed emphasis on protecting the homeland. This is obviously, you know, protecting the United States and its citizens here at home is our one of our core responsibilities. It's a vital national interest. And um, the Department of Defense in particular puts a lot of emphasis on that role and on that responsibility. We spend more time, I think, talking about it in more detail than we did in the DSG, although, frankly, it's been, a, it's been an important part of our strategy and an important mission throughout. The other piece that I think is new compared to the DSG is the emphasis on innovation and adaptability across all of our strategy. In the, um, previously, I think the department, when it talked about innovation or reform, has been primarily focused on the internal institution and how we're organized and you know, improving our acquisition systems and things of that nature. Here we're really trying to talk more comprehensively about the ways that we are pursuing our strategy. And again, that can be everything from how we work with allies and partners in terms of building joint capabilities to how we deploy forces around the world, our global force management process, to how we think about operational concepts in, in our war plans. Um, so those are sort of the, the two big new things I would point to in terms of the sort of the specific um, application of our strategy to the Korean Peninsula, I would say, again, um, a couple of different things. Our, our alliance with the South Korea is incredibly strong. We take those responsibilities very, very seriously. We are very focused on ensuring that we partner with the ROK to provide security and stability on the Korean Peninsula. Um, it's an incredibly important relationship, and we are very focused on it. And I think we feel confident that with the force that we have going forward and the strategy that we have, that we will be able to meet our responsibilities with the ROK to address threats that we might see from the DPRK. Okay, we'll go to the middle here, this gentleman. Hi, thanks for doing this. I'm Andreas Ross with the German newspaper Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. A couple of questions, if I may. One of the more surprising elements of what I have read so far of the text was the continual reference to uh, a, a, I don't think you, you, you formulated like that, but the crisis of readiness in, in the armed forces, uh, particularly in Chairman Dempsey's um, remarks. Is that something that is, in your assessment, only due to uh, the sequester, basically, to budgetary strains, and how does the new strategy address 
uh, these to, to make them ready. If you could just speak to that and mm -hmm. in, in, in what that, mm -hmm. those problems consist. Um, the other question is, of course, the timing um, uh, had it that um, this comes in the midst of the Ukrainian crisis. Um, you said you tried to look 20 years ahead and you didn't come up with a scenario where there might be in at least a, you know, not totally unreasonable worst case scenario, a civil war in an important um, European country involving Russia. So uh, if things deteriorated down that road in Ukraine, what's left of the QDR? Is that, does everything have to be reviewed? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Two very good questions. Uh, why don't I take the, the second one first? Um, you know, I think a strategy would not be a very good strategy if it was designed to try to deal with um, the crisis of next week, next month, even next year. You, you want to design a strategy that's broad enough and, and flexible enough to be able to respond to any number of developments that might, that might come up. Um, you know, I think we um, are humble about our ability to predict the future, and certainly the United States hasn't always predicted security events very well uh, when we look to the past. So I think I would argue uh, that our strategy um, is sufficiently flexible and gives us the tools that we need to be able to address a whole range of crises. Um, and, and what's going on in, U in Ukraine right now I don't think invalidates our strategy at all. We, we, working with our NATO partners and our European partners has been an important part of our strategy, continues to be an important part of our strategy. Making sure that we can live up to our NATO treaty obligations is an important part of our strategy and we will have the tools available to do what's needed over time. I think, you know, at this point in terms of the what's going on in Ukraine right now, it's very important, um, Secretary Hagel outlined this when he spoke earlier this morning, you know, we're focused right now on de-escalating the crisis, supporting the new government in Ukraine, and reaffirming our commitment and reassuring our Central European um, and Eastern European allies. We are in the department focused on supporting the president's emphasis on economic and diplomatic tools to try to bring solutions to the to the process so you know in terms of the military right now i think really the focus is on the diplomatic and economic pieces tools that we have available so so i i would definitely push back on the notion that current events right now somehow invalidate our strategy um, turning to the readiness piece that's a great question. I think it's fair to say that um, the, the readiness challenges that we have been experiencing in the past year and that could potentially continue if we return to sequester level cuts are not exclusively due to sequester. We've spent 10 years in Iraq and Afghanistan. Our, our forces have been deeply engaged and very heavily used. And so just coming out of those two major operations, we've had significant readiness issues that we've had to address. And we've been trying to, prior to PB14, we've been trying to put resources to try to start restoring readiness in our services. The sequester in, in fiscal year 13 was definitely a, a significant problem for us in terms of readiness, and that was a setback. Um, again, I think, you know, the, the relief that we got through the Balanced Budget Act, um, the Ryan Murray legislation that passed relatively recently, Particularly in 14, we were able to use those funds to buy back a lot of readiness, um, training hours, flying hours, things like that. And the $26 billion package that, that we've put forward in um, FY15, if we were to get that um, funding from Congress, much of that would go towards trying to address readiness as well as fix some of our modernization issues. So it's not, strictly speaking, sequester, but certainly sequester has deepened the problem. And, and we're very mindful of the fact that it takes time, as uh, that readiness erodes, and it takes time to um, build that back up. It tends to have some cascading effects that are particularly pernicious. Okay, you had a question. Uh, Pat Reber from the 
Pat Reber from the uh, German Press Agency. Uh, basically, my colleague back there already asked my question, but I wanted to add to that. Great minds uh, think alike. <laughs> Secretary Hagel uh, last week outlined mm -hmm. Uh, the the uh, possibility or the likelihood that there will be uh, more reductions in the U.S. force in Europe, and I'm wondering if you can comment on that in light of again the events in uh, Ukraine. Yes, um, I think at this time <clears throat> our our focus has been, and we've had a process ongoing, looking at how um, how we might consolidate some of our infrastructure in Europe. The department certainly has um, made some reductions to its troop presence in Europe over the last few years, but, but for the moment we're really more focused on looking at consolidating infrastructure as opposed to additional troop reductions on top of what's already been done. So we're really looking at, you know, again, it's a little bit like, it's a little analogous to the base closure process that we'd like to see here in the United States. So we're looking at, you know, to the extent, for example, in Germany that there are many smaller training centers or different types of facilities, do we need to have all of those? Can we consolidate to gain some efficiencies? Um, we are very focused on ensuring that we have um, the forces we need in Europe to both partner with NATO countries and other partners to work on interoperability, to work on, again, maintaining ready forces for NATO, but also in terms of partnering with the Europeans on common threats like terrorist threats. And so as we've looked at um, our posture in Europe, we've been very focused also on looking at kind of what we call new normal challenges, you know, after the Benghazi attack, looking at what kind of a posture do we need to be able to be responsive in areas close to, but not necessarily in Europe, both to again um, deal with violent extremist threats, but also to try to ensure the safety of our personnel and our facilities. So. So I think at this point, I would really focus on the fact that we're looking at our infrastructure uh, and, and not looking to make substantial reductions in our troop presence. I mean, again, if we were to undergo prolonged sequestration in, in the future years and had to go to the um, lower size army, for example, of course, at some point, we'll have to look at where those reductions will be taken. But, but that, you know, we're not there now. Okay, uh, gentleman in the back there had a question. First, I'll come to you next. Thank you. Um, I'm Kakumi Kobayashi with the Kyodo News of Japan, and I'm going back. Would like to back to the Asia Pacific issues, and um, I'm wondering if you could uh, give us a little more details about the phrase in the QDR report, which is uh, an enhancement to the crucial Navy's presence in Japan. Uh, so, could you uh, tell us what kind of ideas? you have in mind something like um, actually increasing number of vessels uh, for deploying in Japan or uh, replacing the current ships with uh, more modernized, modernized ships or something like that? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I would make a couple of comments on that. And for example, we're deploying a second, excuse me, a second Tipi-2 radar to Japan. That's, that's underway. Um, we are looking at, as part of the broader rebalance to Asia-Pacific effort, not, not specific necessarily to Japan, as new capabilities like the F-35, for example, come online, sending those new capabilities out to the Asia-Pacific theater first, um, you know, in advance of going potentially to other places in the world. So I think, you know, broadly we're talking about those kinds of um, those kinds of deployments going forward in the future. Okay, gentlemen, just in the front there. Hi, Kim, oh, uh, of Yanam News Agency, South Korea. Uh, what's your assessment of North Korean factor in your strategy uh, for 20 years? Is, is there? I'm any, sorry, you said the North Korean? North Korean you know, factor. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah, is there any contingency plan you know, going on? And you know, within 20 years, a uh, kind of you know, regime collapse, or in, in that case, What's the you know possibility of you know cooperation with uh, Korea or and possibly with China, and there is also the uh, transfer of the upcom in Korea and and wh what is your uh, prospect of, about that and expectation of the Korea's participation in MDB's defense? Thank you. 
Thank you for those questions. I can I can sort of speak broadly as to how it pertains to the QDR. Some of your more specific um, questions you may want to address to our public affairs officer who can who can probably connect you to people like Dave Helvey who can give you um, very specific answers. But I think, you know, I would say we are, as the QDR says, we're concerned obviously about developments in North Korea. We see um, Kim Jong-un is obviously a, a new leader who is consolidating his power. The regime remains very insular and closed um, <clears throat> and has engaged in a, in a series of provocations not very recently, but um, we are, are working very, very closely, as I said earlier, with South Korea, with the South Korean Ministry of Defense and military forces to do everything we can to partner and ensure there is stability on the peninsula. You know, I think um, we, we've developed, as I'm sure you know, together with the ROK, a counter provocation plan that's designed to help us coordinate and respond to potential future provocations more effectively than ever before. Um, so, you know, I, I think we see that as a as a, a major challenge for us in the region, but, but luckily it's grounded in an alliance that we think is working very, very well. On OPCON transfer, <clears throat> you know, we, we have spelled out, I think, in SA 2015, uh, the intention to eventually transfer operational control. Um, that, that remains, that timeline. We are always in the context of our alliance with the ROK, assessing the conditions on the peninsula and thinking through sort of when the right time is. So um, that's an ongoing dialogue in the context of the alliance, but, but the parameters of Strategic Alliance 2015 are, are in place. Okay, we'll go to the last driver. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. Um, I'm Kunyaki Kitai from Jiji Press and Japanese News Agency. Um, and um, my question it goes for more technical side. And my understanding is the um, last QDO uh, described about the uh, joint AOC battle concept. And my understanding is um, this time around there's no mention on this concept. So could you give us uh, why you omit uh, the detailed description of the concept from uh, the latest QDO? Sure, thank you. Um, I think it's, uh, please don't read in anything into the fact that this QDR doesn't have the phrase air-sea battle concept. We have an office, as I'm sure you know, um, responsible for developing and fleshing out the air-sea battle concept. We still have it. My, my organization works closely with that office and many other offices to think through different elements of our rebalance to Asia Pacific. That, that concept is um, an important part of how we're thinking about operational concepts in the future. We are working on, and I think the QDR does talk about um, investments we're making specifically in terms of um, getting better, um, a, a posture that's more resilient in the Asia Pacific and more able to operate under the threat of, of missile threats, for example. And so many of the ideas that Air Sea Battle is exploring, we are now starting to actually put concrete, concrete investments against to try to start working on exercises, for example, that would, that would be exercising the dispersal of our forces in the region, again, so that we could operate more effectively, making investments in things like airfield um, repair and um, damage repair. So the kinds of things that Air Sea Battle Office is looking at are very much things that are still uh, of interest and of importance to the department. Okay, if there are no other questions, thank you very much for coming today. Thanks, everyone.